Good morning. My name is Micah. Welcome to Northfield Christian Fellowship. I have a passage, this portion of Romans that we're looking at today, the end of Romans 3, is so beautiful. It is so, such a precious passage. I think I have an easier time when there's seemingly ashes in Scripture and scraping that away to try to reveal the diamond underneath. Today I have a passage that is a pile of diamonds. And anything I add, I'd be better off just reading the passage and walking away because anything I add is going to heap ash onto it. So pray with me before we begin. Father, this portion of your word is beautiful. May we see that. Anything I add will only hinder the beauty of your gospel. And so I ask that uh, your word would speak profoundly into our hearts today. And that we would see your beauty, your grace, your redemption, your propitiation, your justification. It's all from you. Thank you, Father. We love you. We love your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 21 through 31. Last week in the first half of Romans 3, Rick covered a tough passage. I mean, if you're looking for some feel-good words to tell you how special you are and how wonderful you are, tune into Joel Osteen. Don't go to Romans 3 because you won't find it there. You remember what he read in that passage earlier in Romans 3? None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That was last week. Those are tough words, especially for the wimpy society that we've become today. We get hurt feelings over gender-specific pronouns. How can we possibly handle the thought of being unrighteous and worthless? But Paul does this for a reason. He just spent the first three chapters in this book of Romans giving us the bad news. And in our passage today, he's about to shift his focus and start to give us the good news. After all, that's what the gospel is, right? It's good news, but it's only good news if we first realize and grasp the bad news. Rick said it this way last week. He said, we have to understand the darkness before we can appreciate the light. Because if I don't realize that I'm a sinner, hopelessly guilty before a holy God, then the fact that God loves me is really no big deal. If I just tell you God loves you, and that's all you know about God, what are you led to believe? Huh. You might not be such a bad guy after all. Of course God loves me. How could he not love such a wonderful person as me? Without the bad news first, the good news can mislead a person into all sorts of incorrect beliefs about both God and themselves. If God just merely loves me and sent his son to die for me, then God's crazy. He killed his son? Why? That doesn't sound like a holy God. That sounds like a lonely, pitiable deity. The fact that he loves me, that, that just goes to show how special I am. I must deserve his love. Do you see how wrong this is? The gospel is only truly good news when it's understood in light of the truth, in light of the facts. God is a righteous and just judge who will not tolerate the breaking of his law. You and I are unrighteous and unjust sinners who always fall short of his perfect law. We never, ever meet up to his standards. Spiritually speaking, we are wicked, worthless, hopeless. That's the message of the first three chapters of the book of Romans up until today in this passage here. And in light of this bad news that we've been hearing, the good news that we're about to hear is such good news. It is worth more than every Bitcoin on the planet. 
It will change your life eternally and wonderfully. So let's read our passage today. Romans 3, verses 21 to the end, verse 31. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Paul starts this passage today saying, but now the righteousness of God. He doesn't say the righteousness of us because we don't have any. The only righteousness we bring to the table is unrighteousness. What is righteousness? What does it mean to be righteous? It means to be right in the truest and purest sense. Because God is righteous, he is 100% true. There is no falsehood in him. God is never wrong. God is never a liar. He is true. He is right. But righteousness is not just being right in truth. It's also being right in morals. Because God is righteous, he is 100% pure and good. There's nothing unethical about God. He never slips up. He is never in sin. God is always righteous. He is right, both truthfully and morally. That is the righteousness that Paul is talking about here in verse 21. The righteousness of God. This phrase, the righteousness of God, it just about drove Martin Luther to insanity. Luther was a monk in Germany in the early 1500s, and his life was defined by a relentless pursuit of righteousness. Because God is righteous, Luther tried harder and harder and harder to also be righteous so that he could be right with God. He memorized most of the Bible. I'm proud of myself when I memorize a verse. He memorized most of the Bible. He spent hours each day in prayer. He denied himself basic necessities such as food, sleep, and shelter. He would physically punish himself. Luther spent so much time in the confession booth that he about drove his superior crazy. And he later said, if anyone could have earned heaven by the life of a monk, it was I. But what saved Martin Luther from this hopeless quest to make himself right with God was this book of Romans. He had been teaching it, and the more he studied it so that he could teach it, the more he came to see that he had it all wrong. He had been pursuing his own righteousness. Do this, do that, be a better person. And it only revealed to him how unrighteous he was. Until he got to this passage that we're in today. And the more Luther understood the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of man and what faith is and what grace is, it finally made sense to him that he could not attain the righteousness of God. It could only be given to him by one who is righteous. Martin Luther went on to call these verses in Romans 3 the chief point, the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. Because these verses that we're looking at today, they are the gospel. They answer the burning question, how can an unrighteous person become right 
in the eyes of a holy God? How can a bad person get right with a good God? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Verse 21 says, You will never get right. You will never get right righteous by following the law. It's not possible because your behavior will never be good enough. Jesus said in Matthew 5, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We cannot achieve God's righteousness through the law. So God manifested his righteousness to us apart from the law. Although, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, Paul says. In other words, the law and the prophets show us what righteousness is, but only God has it. Only God lives it out perfectly, always, 100% of the time. So if righteousness of God is apart from the law, not through the law, then what is it through? Where do we get this righteousness? Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There it is. There's the answer to our question. How can an unrighteous person become right in the eyes of a holy God? Through faith. This is what separates Christianity from every other belief structure out there. You name the worldview, the religion, every other possible route to God says, follow the law, be a better person. Christianity says, you can't follow the law, you're a wicked person. Every other possible route to God says, behave. Christianity says, believe. You name the worldview or the religion. They all insist the way to get right with God is to behave, to be a better person. Only Christianity says to believe. Other religions, Islam, Eastern religions, cults of Christianity, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, they all insist upon you becoming righteous. Agnosticism says be good compared to those around you. Atheism, atheism says you define good and then pursue it. Activism insists you throw yourself into a cause. You name the method, and if it's not Christianity, it's wrong. Because all other routes insist in some way or another that the way to get right with God is to behave. Only the gospel says, believe. Because you can never behave to the degree that God's righteousness insists. You must believe in the one who is righteous on your behalf. What is faith? What does it mean to believe? Here's how Martin Luther defined faith after he became a Christian. He said, faith is a work of God in us which changes us and brings us to new birth from God. It makes us completely different people in heart, mind, senses, and all of our powers, and it brings the Holy Spirit with us. Luther goes on to say, faith is a living, unshakable confidence in God's grace. It is so certain that someone would die a thousand times for it. That's what faith is. Faith is a life-changing belief in Jesus Christ. And it is through this faith that the righteousness of God is manifested to you and me. How can an unrighteous person become right in the eyes of a holy God? Not through the law. It's apart from the law. It's through faith. And it's by grace. Look at the end of verse 22. And into verse 23 also. For there is no distinction. There's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The murderer, the pervert, the armed robber, the perpetual liar, those guys have all sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The person you're sitting beside. So as you look over at them and think, Sinner. 
I want you also to realize that you are the person that they're sitting beside. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why Paul says there is no distinction. Nobody can stand before God in heaven and say, I'd like to make a distinction between myself and that guy. There's no distinction, Paul writes, because the issue is not who is more righteous than the other. The issue is that according to God's perfect standard of righteousness, none of us is righteous. No, not one. But all of us who put our faith in Christ Jesus are, look at verse 24, we are justified by his grace as a gift. The righteousness of God is manifested to us apart from the law, through faith, by his grace. Grace is the active ingredient of our salvation. Faith is the means by which we receive grace, but grace is what justifies us. What is grace? It's an undeserved gift. You and I don't deserve it, therefore it's a gift. If we deserved it, it would be a payment, but because we don't deserve it, it's a gift. We deserve eternal punishment for our unrighteousness, but instead we've been given grace, an undeserved gift. And this gift, according to verse 24, is justification. What is justification? What does it mean to be justified? Are you guys starting to notice how many rich words there are in this passage? Righteousness, faith, grace, justified. It's like we're eating a big bowl of alphabet soup from the Bible. And we're just getting started because there are more great words to come in this passage. Now you know why Martin Luther called this passage the chief point, the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. Justification comes from the same Greek word as righteousness. They mean the same thing, justification and righteousness. Only justification comes from a legal perspective. So when a person is justified, they are legally declared to be righteous. So when verse 24 tells us that we are justified by his grace, it's saying we are declared righteous by his grace. We who are unrighteous are declared to be righteous by his grace. How can that be? How can a good judge declare a guilty sinner to be righteous? That doesn't sound good. I mean, if a person is proven to be guilty of murder and they stand before a judge at the Tazewell County Courthouse, and the judge looks this murderer in the eye and says, I know you did it, but I declare you to be innocent. You're free to go. That would not be a good judge. He would be a very wrong judge. Only a crony of a judge would let the guilty go unpunished. So how can our God, a righteous judge, possibly declare a guilty sinner to be righteous? Because of the source of righteousness. Look at the second half of verse 24. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. More alphabet soup, redemption. What does that mean? To be redeemed is to be purchased. In other words, redemption comes with a cost. For example, when you redeem a gift card, that can only happen because it's already been paid for by you or somebody else. Redemption comes with a cost. In the Bible, redemption is often used in regard to a person being purchased out of slavery. The prophet Hosea purchased his wife out of sex slavery. He paid 15 pieces of silver and a whole bunch of barley to purchase his wife's freedom. She was redeemed, free to go. It didn't cost her a thing. It cost her husband a great deal of money. When you and I were redeemed, we were purchased out of our slavery to sin. 
didn't cost us a thing. That's grace. That's the gift. But it cost Jesus Christ an enormous amount. Because the wages of sin is death, according to chapter 6 of Romans. That's the cost. You want to be redeemed from your sin, purchased out of your sin? The cost is death. Jesus paid it. That's why verse 24 says, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. It gets even better. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. More alphabet soup, propitiation. What is that? Propitiation is the satisfaction of God's wrath. It's God's wrath being satisfied. Because God is righteous, God has wrath against all that is unrighteous. And we don't like the thought of God being wrathful. But if God didn't have wrath against sin, he wouldn't be righteous. Did you get that? If God was not wrathful, he would not be righteous. He'd be like the unjust judge who looked the murderer in the eye and said, I know you did it, but I declare you innocent. Get out of here. That's not righteousness. God's justice won't allow that. There must be a punishment that fits the crime, a punishment that propitiates, that satisfies God's wrath. That's where the cross comes in. At the cross, Jesus Christ both redeemed us and propitiated for us. He redeemed us. He purchased us out of, our sin, out of our slavery to sin and death. And he set us free into eternal life. And he propitiated for us at the cross. He satisfied God's wrath against our sin. Our unrighteousness demanded wrath. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross satisfied God's wrath. In the Old Testament, the same Greek word for propitiation is used for the mercy seat. You remember the mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which is where God told Moses, there I will meet with you. But before the high priest could even enter into the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, he had to sprinkle blood onto the mercy seat. That blood is what propitiated, what satisfied God's wrath so that the priest could enter into the presence of God and live to tell about it. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He went to the cross and he said, there I will meet with you. Propitiation. By his blood, verse 25 says, to be received by faith. Verse 25 continues, and into verse 26 also, it says, This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You remember the question I asked earlier about the judge? How can a good judge possibly declare a guilty sinner to be righteous? Because our good judge in heaven sent his very son to be your substitute. He redeemed you. He propitiated for you. So when God now looks at you, he doesn't see your unrighteousness. It's gone, paid for, satisfied. In fact, what he sees is righteousness. Not your righteousness. Remember, you don't have any. He sees Christ's righteousness that was imputed into you the moment you became a believer. Paul told the Corinthian church, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. Christ took our unrighteousness upon himself and he paid for it on the cross. And in exchange, he gave us his righteousness that he lived out on our behalf. That's how God is both just and the justifier, the one who has faith in, uh, of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is and always will be just 
perfectly holy, demanding justice against all that is unholy. Yet God is also our justifier, ready to say, though you are guilty, I declare you to be innocent. Not because I'm an unjust judge, but because Jesus Christ has redeemed you and propitiated for you. Your sins have been paid for. They are no more. You are righteous. God is just and the justifier. He is full of wrath and full of grace. How is this possible? Because these two seemingly contradictory traits were both satisfied at the cross. The righteousness of God manifested to us through faith, by grace, because Jesus Christ became our redemption and propitiation and satisfied God's justice at the cross. This whole passage is an alphabet soup of theological words, and it is the best soup ever. Gary Rumbold is feasting on it right now. So is Donna Zimmerman in the presence of our Savior. Oh, this redemption is delicious. Oh, this propitiation is the best thing ever. And they will feast for eternity. And so will you and I who are in Christ Jesus. So what's the result of all this? If none of us is righteous, no, not one. If God alone is righteous... If Jesus Christ paid the price for our unrighteousness and imputed God's righteousness into us, what's the result? Verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of grace, uh, by the law of faith. The result of our salvation. The result of the gospel means that not one of us can boast. It is excluded, Paul says, because the gospel is not about anything we do. The only thing we ever do is disqualify ourselves from God's standard of righteousness. The gospel is about what God has done for us through his son. If our behavior played any role in our salvation. We could boast about that. If my goodness helped me in even the slightest amount, I could boast just a little bit that I contributed to my salvation. Yeah, Christ died for me, but I also worked really hard so that he didn't have to carry my whole load. He carried your whole load. Christianity has no place for boasting. No place for self-satisfaction, self-congratulation, self-promotion, self-exaltation. Because it's not about self, it's about our Savior. Boasting is excluded because as verse 28 says, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. In other words, we are justified by our belief, not our behavior. No boasting. There's also no other option. There's no other option. Look at verses 29 and 30. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. How can an unrighteous person become right in the eyes of a holy God? How can a guilty sinner get right before a good God? There is only one option. There is not one God for the Jews with one way to get to him and and then another God for the Gentiles with this other way to get to him. There is one God and one Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no other option. There is no other way to get to God. You don't get to pick your God. You don't get to find the God that works for you. You don't find your God. The God of the universe finds you. You and I are the ones who are lost, not him. And you and I are simply called to respond in faith. Life-changing faith. That's your only option. 
Finally, verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Faith does not overthrow the law because faith and the law were never meant to do the same thing. The law was never given to justify sinners. The closing verse of last week's passage said, through the law comes knowledge of sin. Faith upholds the law. It doesn't contradict the law. Faith says, God, I agree that your law is right. And I agree that I am in the wrong before you. And I agree that righteousness can only be found in the redemption and the propitiation of Jesus Christ alone who obeyed the law perfectly on my behalf. And it is only because of him that I can call you Abba, Father. That is the gospel. Our passage today is the entire gospel condensed into these 11 verses. It's the alphabet soup of our salvation. All these big words, righteousness, faith, grace, justification, redemption, propitiation, they all came together at the cross. Have you come to the cross? Have you put your faith in the redemptive, propitiating work of your Savior? Have you found your way to God apart from the law? Or are you still hoping to work your way to God through the law? The gospel is good news to those who know they can't get to God on their own. But the gospel is hard news to any of you who insist that you're good enough. Because the gospel demands that you humble yourself in that you say, God, I bring you nothing but my sin and my failure. I am not good. You alone are good. And you alone bring righteousness through your son at the cross. If you haven't done that, do it today. Stop relying on yourself and put your faith in the one that you can rely on. Put your faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, your word is beautiful. I love that your word shows the truth of who I am. Putrid. Wretched. It only shows the beauty of your son that much more clearly that he is perfect, holy, powerful to save. The righteousness of God manifested to us hung on the cross that I might be redeemed, that my sins may be propitiated. Thank you, Lord God, for your son. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that gives hope to the hopeless, that gives righteousness to the unrighteous. Thank you for your gospel. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.